Hi everybody, Dr. Alice here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the ways that your brain figures out what kind of sensory information you're looking at and talk about big picture how that information gets processed in your brain. We talked about the different types of receptors that your body uses to detect information. When we talk about those different kinds of receptors, recognize that each of those receptors has a different receptive field. All this fancy word receptive field means is there's only certain kinds of information that different receptors can perceive. Some of the receptive field is based on the physical location of the receptor in your body. For example, if I am visiting New York City and I'm looking out over the skyline, whatever is right in front of me in my field of view, what I can see is that. I can't see what's behind me. I can't see what's down and to the left. I can't see what's down and to the right. I see what's straight in front of the opening of my eye. That's my receptive field. The same idea applies to your skin as well. Each of the receptors that detect stimuli in your skin have a specific area or a receptive field that they're responsible for. So my blue neuron over here is detecting a stimulus maybe a, a touch at this location, but its next door neighbor neuron, the green one, is not detecting anything because it doesn't detect that location on the skin. Sometimes the receptive field of two neurons might overlap with one another. And if that happens, they may detect some of the same stimulus together. But the receptive field, big picture, can be determined simply based on where something's located, either outside of me or on my skin, inside of me. The receptive field, though, can also be based on the stimulus that I'm talking about. So a great example of, of this comes down to those special senses that we were talking about. The special sensory cells inside your ear are really good at detecting sound waves they're not so great at detecting chemicals that, that come off of things that we'd smell. Those are called odorants. But at the same time, the odorants that help our nose to get activated in the sense of smell are different from the tastants that we use to detect something with our tongue. And you better believe that your nose and your tongue can't hear sound waves. So, two ways that we determine the receptive field, what can be detected by a receptor. Number one, is it in a location where the receptor would be able to detect that? And number two, is it coming in the right form? Is it something my receptor can actually detect? In addition to having different receptive fields, another way that our brain figures out what it is that we're detecting is something called sensory coding. When we talk about sensory coding, what we're saying is that different kinds of sensory information ends up in the brain using different pathways. So when I'm talking about tasting something, that's gustation, I'm gonna send that through a very specific set of neurons to my insula where I can process it. If I'm talking about touching something, I'm gonna send that through a very specific set of neurons to my primary somatosensory cortex. So each of these different examples that we see here, they have their own specific neurons that send that information to its own specific place in the brain. Occasionally, we'll actually get more than one kind of information uh, at the same time from, from one experience. A good example of this is when you pet a cat. When you pet a cat, you feel the sensation of the cat's fur. You might hear the cat purring, or you might smell the cat's litter box in the house that you're at. So each of those kinds of information has its own way of getting to the brain, but all of that information will be processed or integrated together to help you understand what it is you're experiencing. In addition to coding different kinds of sensory information differently, we also use what's called frequency coding to help us to determine how intense a stimulus is. 
So what I mean by that is, am I touching something that's kind of hot or really hot? Am I holding something that's kind of heavy or really heavy? So frequency coding is the way that our body figures out how strong or weak a stimulus is. One of the ways that our body can figure out the intensity of, of a stimulus is how many signals a, a neuron is sending in response to it. So let's say that I have two touch stimuli here. First, I touch something really lightly. This gives a little bit of, of a kick in my receptor. It changes its shape a little bit, which causes me to send some action potentials. I detect that. But if I press a lot harder, that's going to activate my receptor even more, which means I'm gonna send even more signals. So if my neuron that's collecting this information sends more signals, my body knows that that sensation was a more intense sensation. The other way that our body can tell that a sensation is more intense is by looking at the number of receptors that have been activated. So when I have a weak sensation, perhaps just a little bit of warmth that I'm feeling on my finger, that may just activate one sensory receptor. But if I touch something that's very hot, that's going to activate many different sensory receptors. So if more receptors are responding to a stimulus, I know that that's a bigger stimulus. If one receptor is responding a lot more to a stimulus, I know that that is a big stimulus as well. We can also figure out what it is that we're looking at based on where we're activating uh, our receptive field. So what I mean by that is which particular part of my skin am I touching? Am I feeling? Which particular part of my visual field am I looking at? So when we're talking about these kinds of sensations on the skin, let's start with areas that have large receptive fields. On the back side of your body, we send a lot of sensory information back to the brain using the same area of skin. We would say that my acuity, how well I can tell what I'm feeling on my back, is, is really low. If you put one finger on my back, it might feel exactly the same as two fingers on my back because I have such a big field that that one neuron is collecting information from. It's not very clear information. But on places like my fingertips, I have very small receptive fields, meaning they're responsible for feeling only a teeny tiny part of my skin. Because I have such small areas that are specifically activated, this gives me higher acuity. Acuity meaning I can interpret very easily or very clearly what I'm feeling. I know for sure that there are two points that are being touched here on my fingertip, whereas on my back, I may not be able to tell that. So when we're figuring out the location of a stimulus where something is interacting with our body, if I have a very small and precise receptive field, I'll be able to tell where that stimulus is. If my receptive field is very large, I may not be able to tell where exactly that stimulus is interacting with me. We can also detect what's going on with stimuli based on a process of something called adaptation. And when I talk about a receptor undergoing adaptation, what I'm meaning is that it's going to no longer respond to the stimulus that it first was responding to. The best way to explore adaptation is to look at some examples together. So some of the receptors in your body are what we call rapid adapting receptors. Rapid adapting receptors, also known as phasic receptors, will receive an initial stimulus, but then they ignore that stimulus until something new happens. A great example of a rapid adapting receptor is the receptors that monitor the fact that you're wearing clothes. Until I mentioned it here, until you read it on your slides, you weren't consciously thinking about putting your clothes on. But when you got dressed this morning, your body detected those clothes going on 
And then it decided, I don't need to listen to this anymore until perhaps you take off your jacket and your body detects that. So a rapid adapting receptor, a phasic receptor, won't keep firing once it's initially fired. You don't need this information forever. I'll stop detecting it so as not to overwhelm you. But we also have in the body what are called slow adapting receptors. And slow adapting receptors, also known as tonic receptors, are the type that will constantly keep detecting information. So we use tonic receptors for monitoring things like your blood pressure or how much pain you're in. These are things that I need to keep a constant eye on because if my blood pressure gets too high or too low, that's problematic for me. If my pain level is going up, I need to deal with that. So notice that when I receive this stimulus and this stimulus sticks around just as long as the other one did, my neuron's not gonna completely shut off like it did up above. A tonic receptor will continue to send some stimuli, continue to let the brain know that it's detecting things until that stimulus goes away. Tonic and phasic receptors the two ways that we can detect information that lasts for a long time. So big picture, how do I use all of these different characteristics of receptors to actually perceive something? Well, step number one is I've got to activate my receptors. So my receptors are activated by a stimulus, either outside the body or inside the body, as they get activated, they're sending information toward the central nervous system. Now, as that information gets to the central nervous system, which remember is the brain and the spinal cord, there are a couple of different things I can do with it. Thing number one is I could process it using a reflex. If the information is very simple and I just need to respond to it subconsciously without thinking, I'll just use what we call a first order neuron, neuron number one, to do a reflex. If that information can't stay in a reflex, if it needs to go up, I'm going to start using what's called a second order neuron. The second order neuron will take that information all the way up to the thalamus in the brain. Remember that the thalamus is the relay center, it's the sorting center. So information goes up the spinal cord, remember using those white matter tracks of the spinal cord, all the way up to the thalamus where it's getting sorted. And once it gets sorted, third order neurons, which go out to the correct locations in the cerebral cortex, in the conscious part of your brain, well, that's where we'll actually start to perceive the information. So first order neurons, bring the information to the spinal cord. If I'm just doing a reflex, they're good enough. Second order neurons take the information up to the thalamus where it can be sorted. Third order neurons take it to the part of the brain where I can actually go through and process it. And that processing is what leads to perception. By sending that information to the correct part of the, the cortex, I'm able to accurately interpret and understand what it is that I'm feeling. 